The first theorem I'll point out is about harmonic functions on a disk. If I have u harmonic on a disk of radius r, centered at zero for now, but we'll adjust that to centered at a specific point, then the conclusion is that u it has a harmonic conjugate, meaning it's the real part of a holomorphic function. But we've proven that on a disk, we can always represent a holomorphic function as a power series. So we can represent u as the real part of a convergent power series. And this will mean that u is the is a power series in z plus a power series in z bar. And this will in particular mean that it's real analytic. So it can be represented in a power series of x and y. And also that it's infinitely smooth and so forth. And so that'll carry over to open sets where this will be true locally. So we'll know that locally harmonic functions are representable by the real part of a power series. We can also recover the coefficients in this power series using some integrals along circles. And this is related to Fourier analysis, but I can compute one half a n r to the n uh, using this integral here on the circle of radius little r, where little r is just less than big R. This is for the case where n is not zero. The case n equals zero, I can compute here. Notice we only really need to know the real part of the zeroth coefficient because the imaginary part disappears anyway. So the first part of the theorem we've already basically proven, and the second part I can just leave as an exercise where you just write out the series in question and integrate against e to the minus i n theta, and we just have to use the fact that e to the i n theta d theta from zero to two pi, this equals one for n equals zero, and zero when n is not zero. Out of this, we can get coefficient estimates analogous to uh, Cauchy estimates. So coefficient bounds. I can bound these coefficients here. Uh, in terms of, let's see, let's stick with red. In terms of the supremum of u on the circle of radius r divided by r n, and then there's this factor of two in here. Uh, this factor just really depends on how you write u as the real part of a holomorphic function. And you could also, just as we did with Cauchy estimates, take an infimum in here to get an even better bound. Uh, another important property of harmonic functions is the mean value property. So if u is defined on the disk of radius r centered at z naught, if it's harmonic, then I can recover the value at the center of this disk by taking its mean value along a circle of radius little r less than big R. And we can prove this using a very special case of the Cauchy integral formula on a circle. So here's a proof. So on this disk, we can write u as the real part of an analytic function. By the Cauchy integral formula, just applied to z naught on the circle centered at z naught, you get a very special formula, which this is significant even for analytic functions. If I write out this complex line integral on this circle, you actually end up with some cancellation in the numerator and denominator, and you just end up taking f of z naught plus r e to the i theta, d theta over two pi, integrated from zero to two pi. And the inside, is the only complex part here. So if we take the real part of both sides, we'll just get the real part of the inside. And this is u of z naught here. So this is exactly what we wanted to know. 
Now the mean value property can actually be used to define harmonic functions only starting with a continuity assumption, and we'll prove that later. It can also be used to prove an important property of harmonic functions called the maximum principle. If I have a harmonic function on a domain u, and if it's non-constant, then it can never attain its maximum over the set u. So the supremum over the set u will always be greater than its value at any specific point. So here's the proof. We have to use the fact that we have a domain here. So we're going to define A as the set of all points where we attain the maximum value. Uh, and we want to show that this is empty. Now, since u is continuous, the set A has to be closed because it's a, the set where uh, u equals a specific value. So it's an inverse image of a singleton. But we can also show that A is open. So if I take any z naught in A, if it happens to be non-empty, then we can find a disk contained in U centered at Z naught, and then we'll apply the mean value property there. U of Z naught will be equal to its mean value along a circle where R is less than capital R. And now, I'll put this two pi back in here, but the point is if I subtract the two sides from each other, I'll get the this integral is zero. So here I'm integrating the constant thing uh, from zero to two pi and dividing by two pi so it doesn't change anything. But now the inside is all non-negative stuff because we're assuming that z naught is an A. So u of z naught is equal to the supremum of all the values. So u of z naught is greater than or equal to all of these other values. And so I'm integrating a continuous function that's greater than or equal to zero, and I'm getting zero. The only way for that to happen is that the function is identically zero, meaning the inside we have u of z naught equals the values on these circles. And this holds for all theta and for all little r less than big R. So we get that this disk has to be contained in A. And that proves that A is open. And as we already said, it's closed. And so by connectedness, if A is non-empty, then A has to be the whole set, which would imply that U is constant and equal to its supremum. So we have to conclude that A is empty and u never attains its supremum inside the set. So this is the maximum principle for harmonic functions. There's also a maximum principle for analytic functions, which I'll leave as an exercise. It's using the modulus of the analytic function, and so you have to think of a way to play around with this to use the maximum principle for harmonic functions to prove it, and there are other ways to prove it too. But if I have f analytic, and non-constant on a domain u, then the supremum of the modulus of f is always greater than the modulus at any specific point. OK, that's all I'll say about harmonic functions and, its, and their connection to the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So the big takeaways from this video series are that a function is analytic if and only if it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And the Cauchy-Riemann equations can be used to show that analytic functions have a very nice geometric property, meaning they're locally conformal when the derivative is non-zero. And finally, you can use the Cauchy-Riemann equations to study real parts of holomorphic functions or more generally harmonic functions.